Hello, beautiful people. Woo! Hello, San Francisco. Good evening. All right. Thank you for joining us for this really special event. During summer, I hosted a whole series on death, dying, and grieving. Jim, who called me bananas, was um, astounded and surprised by how many people turned out over summer for such programming. So we're going to keep it rolling. A uh, couple of announcements first. Uh, obviously, the book is available in the back for purchase. And uh, our library likes to acknowledge that we are on the land we're gathered on today is the traditional land of the Ramitush Ohlone people. We like to give thanks and respect to the Ohlone people. And we do that by taking care of the earth, the animals, and each other. We acknowledge that non Ohlone residents are the guests on this occupied land, and we are grateful for the opportunity to learn and live and play here. We promise to uplift and respect the Ohlone people who are still here and their history and their work. And on top of that, let's just be committed to be kind and to love one another. Check out Segorte Land Trust, an all women led organization out of the East Bay doing a lot of amazing work in the land back movement. I also want to thank our amazing behind the scenes crew who keep this place running, not the beautiful face of the library, but the backbone of the library, security, custodial media services who are amazing. I want to thank all of you who are here tonight and who use our resources on a daily. So tonight we're here for a very special event for the celebration launch of There at the End, Voices from the Final Exit Network, a celebration of 20 years. The anthology captures the experience of those navigating end of life decisions alongside the compassionate volunteers who support them, including library famous <laughs> retired librarian Jim Van Buskirk, along with, yes, give it up. Retired or retired. <laughs> and a senior guide from Final Exit Network. But first we're gonna show a quick video and then we'll be on with the discussion and get your Q&A ready which will happen at the end of the discussion. Thank you all. You know, as a society, we're not very good at talking about death. We joke about it in the abstract, or we say, never want to go like that. Or, living like that would be totally unacceptable to me. Or, that's not how I want my story to end. But we don't take the next step of considering how to avoid that future for ourselves. Because when it comes time to make real choices about what we want for our death, or to support someone close to us who wants to direct their own death, things get a lot trickier. Because talking about death is really hard. We're all going to go sometime, and most of us would like to do it on our own terms. Maybe you're watching this because you've received a medical diagnosis of an incurable or unmanageable disease or of a degenerative neurological condition. Maybe a family member or a loved one has. Or maybe you just want to know more about who we are and what we do. For over 20 years, Final Exit Network's mission has been to educate individuals who meet our criteria on practical, peaceful ways to end their life, offer them our compassionate presence when they do so, and defend their right to choose. Over time, we hope to normalize choice in dying so that it's not such a difficult path for those who want that choice. We want more people to know about their options and the power they have at a time that, too often, is surrounded by doubt, silence, and fear. Our Exit Guide program provides those who meet our criteria with education on a safe, comfortable method of ending their own life and companionship at the time of your exit, if that's what you desire. The Exit Guide program serves competent adults faced with intractable suffering from medical conditions that seriously impair their quality of life. Anyone interested in Exit Guide support must submit an application, have their medical records reviewed by a team of healthcare professionals, and work with the guides in carefully and consciously planning their exit. We provide our services free of charge anywhere in the United States. We don't provide any assistance, and we don't provide any equipment. Everything we do is legal. Now, 
Why is what we do necessary? Especially when there are a growing number of states that are passing medical aid and dying laws, which allow people in certain circumstances to end their lives under medical supervision. Well, that's just it. Those state laws only cover folks with terminal medical diagnosis who have six months or less to live. A lot of people just don't fit that category. There are horrendous illnesses, such as dementia and neurodegenerative diseases, that people must suffer with for many years before being within six months of death. Dementia leaves many people feeling particularly helpless because even if you live in a state with medical aid and dying, by the time you're within six months of death, you're no longer competent and therefore you can't use the law. You're just stuck. We're able to serve people with a dementia diagnosis before they lose competence because our guide program does not require applicants to be within six months of death. Ending your own life is not illegal, as well it shouldn't be. But our right to self-determination doesn't mean much if we don't have the knowledge to comfortably and safely exercise that right if we wish to. We found that having the knowledge and the means to control one's own death brings incredible peace of mind to those facing a scary future. It frees us from the crippling fear of the kind of death we want desperately to avoid. And it releases us to get on with our lives and enjoy what we have. It might sound counterintuitive, but we teach people how to die so that they can live well while they still choose to. We think that the way we die should be surrounded by as much care and consideration and joy and celebration as the way we're born. We also want people to know that Final Exit Network is more than just the Exit Guide program. We facilitate online discussion groups about choice and dying. We support people in creating an advanced directive to document their wishes for their end of life decisions. It's never too soon. And we provide resources for those who want to supplement their standard advanced directive with specific instructions should they suffer from dementia. We can even provide legal support for people who've clearly documented their wishes for end-of-life dementia care, but whose wishes aren't being followed. Death is part of life. And many of us want to make sure we get to shape our life's ending, to make it as meaningful and true to our values as the way we led our lives. If you have any questions about Final Exit Network, We'd love to hear from you. Please feel free to reach out to us, and one of our wonderful volunteers will get in touch. We're looking forward to hearing from you. And, and here are two of Fenn's wonderful volunteers. <laughs> <laughs> So Jenny and I have known each other for 45 years, we figured out. And we'd sort of lost touch with one another. And do you want to tell a story about how we reconnected? Well, you can start, and then I'll butt in when I feel, nece um, feel it's necessary. So I had been working as a, I had been volunteering. And I should say that, um, well, it's, uh, where do I start? Um, my, I accompanied a woman, or I uh, was with a woman who invited me to be with her uh, at her exit. And I barely heard of Final Exit Network. I didn't know how this worked. I didn't know anything. Well, who were the exit guides who supported my pal Margaret? Brian and Lowry. Brian is the president of the board. Lowry is the uh, exit guide coordinator extraordinaire. She's our, she's our boss. So the blue shirt and the white shirt in the film. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and Mary, the executive director, hadn't even uh, come on board. So I was so impressed with Brian and Lowry as their compassion, their professionalism, their patience. I was like, wow, this is an incredible support service. So I immediately joined the organization, wrote an article about it, and then was brought on board. But Jenny didn't know any of this. Now, okay, I'll pick it up from okay. here. <laughs> so my mother had uh, chosen her own death and had died, and she'd been a member of the Final Exit Network. And um, a few years after that, I was finally retired. My son was in college. I had free time. And I'm like, oh, you know, I joined Final Exit myself, and they had a call for volunteers. And I thought, well, maybe this is something that I could do. I'm kind of interested in this. And I had 
never really been squeamish about death, like actually one of the things that Jim and I enjoyed doing in our youth had been to go visit cemeteries and enjoy having picnics there. And um, he even gave me these Day of the Dead earrings that I'm wearing tonight. So we kind of have this history with that. And so I applied to the program. I was so shocked that I got accepted. I thought they would take medical professionals or you know, therapists or counselors or something like that. I'm a graphic designer, you know, it's like, that just seemed like a weird fit. But um, I got in and I said to the woman who called, you know, well, who else, you know, from California is going? Like, how many people are going to be there? And she's like, well, we just have one other person from California and he's from San Francisco. And I just like blurted out, is it Jim Van Busker? <laughs> because, you know, I knew Jim had been doing like death cafes and things and it's just like, what a weird connection, like just out of the blue. And we both independently had applied the same year and we, we went to the training together and we went to Madonna concert at one o'clock in the morning. <laughs> we had a lot of fun. <laughs> Back to you, Jim. Uh -huh. So um, <laughs> what we thought we'd do is read a few very short excerpts and mostly be in conversation and then me be in conversation with you. So Jenny was gonna read just a few paragraphs from Lowry's uh, essay that appears early on to sort of, well, you'll see what it does. Yeah, so this is the white shirt. Um, her story's called The Right to Write Your Own Life Story by Lowry Brown. A growing number of us feel that when the time is right for us, death should comfortably be in our own hands, not in the hands of doctors or lawyers, priests or politicians. We want to be able to end our own lives in our own homes at a time of our choosing without society getting its collective knickers in a twist that our considered personal choice is somehow an affront to, and I stumble here, how things are supposed to be. Are we hearing feedback? I'm hearing feedback. No, is it just me? Okay. Um, we are supposed to be living in small bands, hunting and gathering and dying long before the age of 30. Let us dispense with fanciful imaginings of what is supposed to be and instead consider what makes sense. Let's also dispense with any romantic notion of a natural death. We have always done everything in our power to wrestle death from the hands of nature. I had severe pneumonia as a newborn and was in an oxygen tent for days. That would have been my natural death. I took another stab at it in my 20s with a climbing accident that without medical intervention would have finished me. Whatever road to death I take, it is way too late for it to be natural. At a less philosophical le level, is either life or death natural if you have medication supporting your circulation or oxygen supplementing your breath, a pacemaker guiding your heart, a caregiver spooning applesauce into your mouth because you no longer know how to feed yourself? And there's more to this essay. <laughs> Buy the book and you'll find out. <laughs> um. So uh, Jenny and I uh, volunteer in very different um, capacities. Uh, Jenny is an exit guide and I'm a regional coordinator. And I thought I would read um, uh, my piece that explains how, what a coordinator does and how I got involved. Uh, so this was written when I first started with the organization probably just about six years ago, maybe more. Um, my involvement with Final Exit Network has been both a slippery slope and a crash course. It started when a regular attendee of the Death Cafe I co-facilitated for several years invited me to witness her exit. I barely knew about Final Exit Network, but was mightily impressed with the expertise and patience of the guides. I immediately came home and joined Fan. An article about my experience wound up on the cover of Fenn's magazine and the response was gratifying. Folks requested multiple copies and I sent it to friends and colleagues in an effort to increase awareness of Fenn services. In the midst of the attention, I contacted the lead coordinator, Ann Mandel Mandelstam, with whom I began communicating regularly. And that Ann is the person that Jenny was on the phone with. Um, uh, at one point, Anne invited me to consider coming on board as a regional coordinator. We met briefly in my backyard garden while she was in the Bay Area visiting family. Armed with a notebook filled with forms and guidelines and everything I'd need to know, she encouraged me to give it a try. I realized the only way to determine whether this was a good fit was to get my feet wet. I agreed to start by taking over Texas, 
Colorado, New Mexico, and Arizona, with the caveat that I could bail at any point. I was barely in the proverbial saddle when the messages started coming in, several at once. Before returning calls, I wanted time to hear the prospective client's story and explain FEM services. Suddenly, my schedule, which had fe felt fairly flexible, was full of demands. Of course, whenever I'd set aside 45 minutes to phone a client, I reached their answering machine. Initially, I was overwhelmed by the combination of time management, discretion, to the point of paranoia, and heartbreaking stories. I relied on Anne's support and encouragement. Over the course of many phone calls and emails, her humor and pragmatism were wonderfully grounding. Lordy lordy, Arizona hasn't been so busy in months. Someone must have heard there's a new sheriff in town. <laughs> in the first few days, in the first two days, I spoke with a 19-year-old with many ailments and no support system, then with a 42-year-old fellow in Colorado whose fortitude in recounting his heartbreaking situation had me in tears. A retired pharmacist in Colorado called on behalf of his best friend's wife suffering in the final stages of ALS. A few days later, a 92-year-old veteran sought support in Arizona. At the end of her call, her daughter expressed appreciation, saying she could see from her mother's face how much more comfortable she was having gathered initial information about FEN services. After the challenges of dealing with this, these disparate and desperate people, I could see the benefit in helping folks who have such little hope left. But I was concerned whether I was saying the right things, and even that the folks on the other end of the line were who they said they were. Knowing about Fenn's previous legal problems, I certainly didn't want to be the target or cause of any further entanglements. I was so green that I had to double check with a fellow coordinator to make sure who prospective clients should send their applications to. Colorado mailed his personal letter and re medical records to me forthwith, calling Ann, causing Anne to quip, not only are you getting your feet wet, but I am betting you are damp up to your knees. Anne generously offered to be the interviewer, which simplified the next step. I can't empathize enough her kindness and compassion, both for this neophyte and for our prospective clients. When I read her interview report, I wept again. She had beautifully captured his untenable condition. Anne walked me through the steps of assembling his case file, which I sent to the chair of the Medical Evaluation Committee using a new encrypted email account specifically for this purpose. Success is sweet and sad in this situation. Empathy is as much a liability as anything else. In the midst of all this came a message from a member who was having trouble with the online procedure of having her employer match her membership dues. Since Anne was my go-to, she forwarded my query to Fenn's office manager, who called to tell me how she had sorted out the situation. We had a long, convivial conversation, reinforcing my growing suspicion that Fenn volunteers are a rare and brilliant breed. Shortly after, I went through the same procedure with the woman in Arizona. I didn't realize how time-consuming it would be to assemble the personal letter, the medical records, the interviewer's report, then scan them for the committee and keep the client apprised of each step. Eventually, her case was accepted for senior guide assignment. In my first few weeks, I had successfully shepherded two appreciative clients through the process, a challenging trial by fire, and the pace, fortunately, diminished a little. Only now, months later, do I recognize a confidence and comfort level as I educate clients on their options for FEN services. I am connecting immediately, intimately, and intensely with people I would otherwise never encounter. Their profound gratitude for the work of FEN volunteers makes it all wonderfully rewarding. Um, so, uh, so that gives you an idea of what a coordinator does. And if an application is accepted, then the exit guide is assigned. Do you want to? Am I reading my story now or just talking about being the you exit can, guide? Whatever you want. <laughs> As I tell my clients, it's all about you. Um, well, I think I'll just say I became an exit. I wanted to become an exit guide because 
my mother did not end up using, even though she was a member of Final Exit, she did not end up participating in the guide program. And uh, it took her four attempts before she died. And I tried to support her as much as I could the whole way through. And it was nerve wracking, heartbreaking. There were very poignant moments. And I just really didn't want other families and other you know, people who were in that position to have to try and stumble through this. Um, what I love about being a guide is that I, at least I hope that I give people the confidence that they know that this process is gonna work for them. My boss up there does not like me saying this, but when there's a guide there, this has been 100% effective. I think everybody's, one of their biggest fears is, I'm gonna be brain dead, this isn't gonna work. Um, but I have a new saying, which I wrote down in case I forgot, but everyone dies on our watch. So <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to, you know, nobody has to worry. If anybody's read the Final Exit book, you know, it's like, thing, you know, people who jump off bridges, only, you know, 35% of them die, or people who try and shoot themselves. I mean, it's all these different ways where it's not a guarantee, but this process is a guarantee, and it is quick, and it is painless. And um, I feel like being a guide, I have two main things that I do. I, um, I teach people how to build their kit so that they can um, choose their own death when they want to, and if they want um, I will be there with them when they decide to exit. And, you know, I can remind them of all the knobs and all the things to do as they're going through it. It's not against the law to um, teach someone how to kill themselves. I'm sure this book is in this library here. The information is available. It's also not against the law to be with someone when they're dying. You know, I'm not a mandated reporter. I'm not this person's doctor or therapist. Um, so I can be there. It is against the law to provide physical assistance. And so that's why um, during the application process, there are a lot of like kind of strange questions of, oh, can you a button a button? Or can you put your hands over your head? And all these are, you know, to make sure that you've got the physical dexterity um, or the ability, you know, to do all the parts that you need to be able to do. So that's really important. Um, Jim, I don't know if I'm going off on no, tangents, no, but, this is... uh, you know, and another thing is that our organization does not do emergencies. You have to, um, you know, apply while you're still physically able to take your own life, and uh, generally this can take, you know, if you got ushered through really quickly with your application, possibly from the time you turn it in until when you exit, it might be six weeks, but most of the time, I've never had anybody move through that quickly, and I've been um, a senior guide now for three years and working with the program for five years. So, you know, people need to think about like maybe three months of how much time that they need to have. Um, yeah, the recommendation is initiating an application when the person thinks they're within six months to a year of wanting to choose the time of their death. And if the application is accepted and they haven't exited at the end of three years, we ask them to reapply to make sure that we have all the current information. So in that process itself, there's volunteers all over the country. Um, our, we only use phone and um, snail mail. So it can take four to six to eight weeks just from the application to getting the exit guide and then another four to six to eight weeks working with the, with the guide. Um, but do you wanna read the, read the piece about your mom or part of it? Yeah, so um, my piece is a little bit longer, so I'm just going to read part of it. And just to set the scene, my mom had had a um, medical crisis at one point, and she was not getting any relief. She just had this intractable pain. And so she was all ready to you know, end her own life, and I totally supported her on this. Um, I, you know, like, like a lot of people, I wish we could just, you know, put ourselves down the way, you know, animals can be put down when they're in pain. Um, 
but we didn't really have a plan. And my mom was going through like, well, you know, I could buy a gun or I could stick the hose from the exhaust into the car and close the windows and turn on the car. Uh, I could slip my wrists in a hot bathtub. I could, you know, take all the pills in the house and swallow it with all, you know, the alcohol that I have. And um, she kind of decided on the alcohol pills method, but luckily we, she was able to get some relief and she passed through that crisis. And so after that happened, I sat down with her and I said, you know, this is not tenable. I cannot go through this with you again. You need to have a better plan. And so we together went online. Um, we looked at Hemlock Society first and it really doesn't exist anymore. I guess there's a few chapters, but most of the links will take you to Final Exit. And that's where we found out about it. She became a member, she got the book. We both read it and we you know, learned how not to do it. And the method at the time was the helium method. And so instructions came with the book and she put her kit together. Um, and, you know, and she had it for like whenever the next time would come up. And it made me feel a lot more comfortable that there was a real plan, that this wasn't gonna be a last minute scramble. So anyway, I'm gonna start the story. Uh, So years went by, and mom's health declined. She was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes and struggled to control her unstable blood sugars. Her arthritis crippled her hands to the extent that she couldn't garden or even hold a book. She had been a volunteer for a project to clothe low-income children, but she no longer had the physical stamina required, and she had to quit. One of the final straws was developing cognitive decline and having her bridge partners ask her to leave their foursome because she was making so many mistakes. My mother prided herself on her intelligence, independence, and ability to be of service. At 79, she decided she had lived a long and wonderful life, but now, with this limited experience, with this limited existence, it was intolerable, and she was ready to leave. In the meantime, California's End of Life Option Act, the one passed in June 2016, had just gone into effect. We careful, carefully studied its requirements. I doubted my mom would qualify since she did not have end-stage disease with a six-month or less life expectancy. But she was confident that her personal doctor of more than 30 years would support her claim that old age was a terminal illness. When we went to visit him, he explained that my mother's request was his first, and he agreed to look into it. A week later, he told her that she wasn't eligible for that life-ending option. She was furious and felt betrayed, but I reminded her that she had her final exit network backup plan and everything was still in her closet. But suddenly for me, this was real, not a hypothetical what if. I started feeling sick to my stomach. Is she truly gonna go through with this? Is she really ready? Am I? What would happen if this didn't work and she ended up in a coma? I couldn't put a pillow over my mother's face and I didn't want to be directly involved with her death. I was a single parent of a teenager, and I didn't know what the laws were regarding assisting a suicide, and we were both unwilling for me to go to jail. I strongly encouraged Mon to apply to Final Exit Network's Exit Guide program, but since she had been rejected by her beloved doctor, she was worried she wouldn't be accepted, so she was on her own. So you'll have to, as I said before, get the book and find out how this ends. <laughs> um, but... This, it just really, for me, the reason I wanted to read this part was just there's so much anxiety around this, and I feel like with Final Exit, and especially once you get a guide, they can calm everything down, and they can really help walk a person through this and, um, you know, give them the support that they need to be able to make the, to choose when they, they're going to choose on their own when they want to die, but when that time comes, you know, we can be there to make sure that it happens correctly and that they really do get to die. So um, that's just been my big motivation. Well, and so I, I have known Jenny, as I said, for years, and I knew her mom, and I had encouraged, and I'd heard these stories, and I had encouraged Jenny to set them down, and I... Uh, so I don't want to take full credit, but uh, so, but at what, and so, uh, whenever it appeared, I get the copy of the 
the Fenn newsletter, and Jenny's piece is published anonymously, but there's a big picture of her mom. I was like, <laughs> oh, okay, I know who this is. <laughs> so it was a little... Yeah, and actually it's kind of sad that, um, you know, we didn't have photos in the book, and I don't know if it would have been appropriate, but the picture... Um, was after my mother had several failed attempts, as I had said, and so her second last dinner that we had together, um, she decided that she was going to have a milkshake. You know, she hadn't had sugar for a long time because she was uh, diabetic, and she was like, maybe this will kill me. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, there's a picture of her drinking a milkshake, and I thought that was funny. <laughs> Well, and and to Jenny's point about solace, um, I was on the phone last night with uh, a caller who, she said, I can't tell you how much better I feel just talking to you, knowing that you're going to send me the application materials, and I will, I have a plan. And uh, she said, I've, I'm going to be able to sleep tonight. I've been so anxious and worried, and I can't breathe, and I'm breathing better. So whether or not she applies, whether or not she's accepted, whether or not she uses an exit guide and chooses the time of her death, Final Exit Network has brought her some solace, some control in a completely uncontrollable situation. So, and I don't think, I don't know if we have statistics, maybe we do, maybe Lowry does, of how many applications are accepted and of those, how many actually go to the finish line. Do you know? I want to say it's about 25%, but I don't know. If yeah, that's it's true. not, certainly not 100%. Yeah, so. I think it's a lot lower than we expect. Um, and I guess I was going to talk a little bit about the genesis of the anthology. So in, uh, so Brian is always talking about the power of personal stories, and I completely agree. And so I, I thought in almost every issue of the magazine, there's one personal narrative from a family member, from a guide, from some uh, something. And the rest of the magazine is really important information, but it's more uh, news developments, politics, polemics, procedures, different things. And I thought, well, wow, what if we just pulled out all of those personal stories? And so I went through the, the magazines and I, and I found a lot of them. And I thought, oh, well, I'll augment these with some interviews, with some, um, some solicited uh, essays, and when we pulled it together, we realized, oh my gosh, it's it's all here. So except for soliciting um, essays from uh, three really important, powerful pioneers in the movement, Derek Humphrey, who, as Jenny said, wrote Final Exit, um, and Faye Gersh, who's one of the co-founders of the organization, and then uh, my friend Miriam Coppins, who uh, headed up the Hemlock Society office in Portland and has been in the movement since the 80s. So I thought it was really important to hear their voices. But beyond that, the book sort of assembled itself. And I want to give a shout out to the team because... Um, I, I said, okay, I can edit the book, but I don't want to be the project manager. I don't have any experience in actually publishing it. So uh, Mary and uh, uh, Vienna and Christina and Jenna and I would have regular meetings and the emails would fly back and forth. And um, another one of our colleagues, Janet, uh, did proofreading and she has a piece in here. So it's... it's um, a lot of pretty short, pretty powerful pieces that I think demystify what Final Exit Network does, how, how it operates, who we are, why we do what we do. Um, because it seems, uh, often when I talk to people, they, there's a lot of either lack of information or as much misinformation. Well, I don't live in a right to die state, so what are my options? Well, Final Exit Network supports people in all 50 states. Our legal counsel advises us 
everyone has the, uh, has the right to hasten their own death. So right there, uh, it's a piece of information. And as Jenny suggested, uh, one needs to be able to carry out the exit while they're physically and cognitively able to do it. So some of our colleagues refer to this as leaving some life on the table. Not my favorite expression, but I guess it, it actually um, conveys. Um, are there other things we were going to say? Go ahead. Um, well, I think you were going to, you wanted to talk about like, uh, what are some of the things that have been, uh, you know, really that have impressed you working with people or what, um, what was our question? Right. <laughs> oh, well, highlights, uh, either yeah, highlights positive exactly. or negative yeah. of, of the, uh, of being a volunteer. Do you want to start? Um, yeah, I, I'm kind of like a voyeur and kind of nosy, so I feel bad like even talking about some of this stuff. But I mean, it's really interesting to find out like what do people who know that they're going to die, what do they do the day before that they're going to, you know, that they die? And, you know, some people, like one woman, she and her best friend watched the musical Mamma Mia together one last time and had lunch. Um, another woman went with her daughter and had a nice drive through the wine country and had lunch. Um, somebody else ordered like a box of Snickers bars and ate some, you know? It's just kind of like the things that people chose and I think that that's really interesting. And then also, you know, kind of what are the last thing people do before they die? And um, it's so many like little mundane things, but like one woman picked up a can and put it in the recycling. Another woman was like busy hanging up clothes from the dryer, you know, and she was living by herself and you're kind of like, who are you hanging the clothes up for? But, you know, but it was like something that was just important to her. Uh, another woman was out watering her garden. Um, and, you know, it's just really kind of touching to see like what it is that people do in those last moments, you know, before they're like, okay, I'm ready to go. And uh, I don't know, I just think it's kind of poetic or something. I think it's really beautiful. I have, so I don't work as an exit guide, although I have taken, we took the training together, but I've been with several people, and the first woman, uh, and the story's in the book, um, so Lowry and Brian and I are working with her, and she's getting frustrated, and she can't see well, and she's getting impatient, and the phone rings, and she answers it, and there's this long, weird conversation about $11, uh-huh. <laughs> in an envelope, okay, tomorrow, uh-huh, and it's going on and on and on. And the three of us, and I didn't know them, I'm like, what? there is no tomorrow. I mean, there might be $11, but there's yeah. not gonna be, and so, so the, Margaret comes back and sits down with us and she says, would you please not let me answer the phone again? <laughs> <laughs> It's amazing. There's actually, you know, quite a bit of humor kind of at the end. Like people, most people, you know, by the time they've decided to do this, they're really ready. And, um, you know, it's a relief for them. And, you know, but there's some humor too. Well, and there's some sadness. Uh, course, another, yeah. another friend that uh, she said, oh, could you come over uh, early and we'll hang out before the guides arrive, of course, whatever you want. And I said, well, how are you doing? And it was so lovely and awkward and profound and mundane. And she said, well, to be perfectly frank, I'm a little sad and a little angry that I've had to do this all in secret, that I can't say goodbye to my neighbors or my nephew or whomever. But we've had several situations where close friends, close family members, have alerted the authorities either before, during, or after, and put the organization and its volunteers in legal jeopardy. And they put themselves at risk because that would be the only time this wouldn't work. This would be like, oh, it's not 100% anymore. It would be that if you know the authorities came when you're like five minutes into the process, maybe they would rip the bag off. You'd still be alive but brain dead. So discretion is really, really important. Um, I'm going to just butt in here. Yeah, but, I mean, we really do encourage people to talk to all their family about 
and their friends, you know, that this is something that they want to do, that, you know, self-deliverance, being able to choose their own death is, you know, one of their values, and that's really important to them, and that, you know, and if you are if in the situation where you've been accepted to our program and you are planning on doing this, you know, to let people know that this is going to be in your future sometime, but don't tell them the day. Do not, like, you know, just be, you know, try and be cool, okay? Um, yeah, so. I often tell people, um, you know, you can say, I'm in such agonizing pain, I don't know how much, how much longer I can deal with this. But don't say, oh, I just got off the phone with Jim from Fenn, and uh, I'm going to initiate an application, because havoc can ensue. Um, but should we start taking questions? And then yeah, I, that's a good idea, because we only have And then I have one more left. little thing to, I'll read at the end. Yeah. Um, Anissa's got the microphone. We do really want to hear from you. Um, not about your specific situation, because if you, I should just say that if, if you know someone who might be interested, you can contact the um, organization and the regional coordinator for California, or wherever they happen to be, can provide one-on-one -on -one counseling, which is what I do, but not for, not for, the, uh, for California. Yes? What are the criteria that would determine a person would not be accepted? Not um, be accepted. Not be accepted. Well, so it can go one of three ways. And it's a, the medical review committee is a team of three medical professionals assigned to that specific case. So it might be different three for you and different three for me. So usually by the time it gets that far in the process, um, they say, yes, the application is approved for exit guide assignment. Sometimes they say, we really are not sure. We'd like a letter from a specialist. We'd like one more test. We need a little more information. And what, uh, or they say, we can't approve this application, which uh, means that there's something in the application that might put the volunteers or the organization in jeopardy. So either uh, it's too soon, there's dysfunctional family communication. There's something that might not work. And I've had, more than once, applications that were accepted, and then the exit guide answered more questions, went over more details, and said, no, this is not going to fly. There's something, something amiss. I mean, I want to say that if you are submitting an application, you will be talking to somebody like Jim, but not Jim, because he doesn't do California, um, like the coordinator for that state. And they will kind of give you some ideas about how to you know, make your application as strong as possible. So um, you know, I've, I feel like the coordinators are really there to help people get what they want. Yeah, yeah I th the coordinators are the front line. Yeah. And, uh, and then anything we can't deal with, we just hand off to the exit guides and <laughs> well, let them deal with it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, is there a cost, and if so, what is it? It's completely free. Wow. But you do have to pay about $350 to buy your own equipment. So you, are, you have to pay for your own stuff. So that's probably the cost. But, I mean, it's kind of amazing. We get, you know, the membership that people pay for the organization. People give us, you know, endowments and stuff like that. And that pays for all of our volunteer costs. You know, people fly... We, we always travel in pairs, so even though I'm a senior guide, I have an associate guide that comes with me, and these people, you know, fly from Louisiana or Portland or wherever, and uh, that's covered by the organization. So it's free. Yeah, no out-of-pocket expenses. I mean, even the, well, the applications I uh, the, the equipment. Yeah, yeah. no, um, but for the guides. So right. if they have to fly across the country, book a hotel room, rent a car, meals, everything is, is paid for. So the only cost to the, to the client is the uh, equipment itself, as Jenny said. But just to be clear, we don't get paid. Just no, 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 we, yeah. we are volunteers. Yeah. Could you um, address somebody who doesn't want to die in their own home? Um, we usually convince people to die in their own home um, because we don't want to, 
the way we usually do this is that we maybe do the exit in the evening and then like the next day the person is discovered and we have a whole discovery process. Like maybe a friend or family member from another state calls and says, listen, you know, my aunt has been telling me that she's gonna be you know, taking her own life. She told me this was gonna happen. I, been, I call her every morning, I call today, she's not picking up the phone, can you go check on her? Um, we really don't wanna traumatize anybody. We don't want, you know, bodies to be found by hotel maids or something. So we really try and convince the person, no, you know, to do this in your own home. Um, so, I mean, that's something that gets worked out with the guide, but uh, usually we get, we convince them. I had one, I have one person who's planning she doesn't want to do it in her house. Her partner is still around, and she feels like he'll be traumatized by, you know, if she dies in her home. And so she's planning on exiting in her horse trailer. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, part of this is that it has to be private. You know, we don't want people walking in on what's happening, and um, we don't do hotels, just FYI. Yeah, but that's a good question, Olga, yeah. because a lot of people, oh, can I do it in a park? No, yeah. because you risk being interrupted, which cannot happen, it, it's, it has to be secure. Yeah, we have to make sure there's, you know, we, t we ask, like, do you have security cameras? Like, do people just drop at your house? Like, security is a very important um, issue for us. You've mentioned several times equipment or a kit. What kind of things is that? Well, we use the inert gas method, and it used to be helium, and people could go purchase like a party time thing, you know, like a, to blow up balloons. But don't do that anymore, people, because uh, they mix that with oxygen now, and it won't kill you. So um, now we're using nitrogen, and, you know, you need to get that. You have to get um, a regulator. You've got to get some tubing. You've got to get a plastic bag. You've got to get some tape. We teach people how to make the make the thing. So if you get accepted into the program, um, after we talk to your family, we hang out, we hold the shopping list, kind of hot, hold it hostage until we've talked to our, you know, important family members, and then we send that. And then most of the stuff you can buy within a couple of days. Um. Um, I have a couple of questions, actually. Uh, my brother-in-law died from pancreatic cancer three years ago and in Connecticut. And it was a year and a half that was good, six months that was bad. The last month was hideous, and my, he and my sister w wished they had been in a state that allowed um, doctor-assisted um, end-of-life care. So one of the questions, and she's been actually active in the movement in Connecticut to try to change the state legislature to vote um, to allow doctor-assisted end-of-life care. But with your method, is it, if someone was to do that, I mean, he, he would have been able to do that probably in the last, um, certainly four weeks before he passed away. He would have been able to make that decision and, and had total family support for it. But what is the end result in, in terms of the when, the coroner comes, what are they going to say? It's a, that suicide. It's a suicide. It's a suicide. Sorry. Yeah, this, we, this is not medical aid in dying. There's nothing medical about this. This is like MacGyver. You know, it's like you're putting little bits and pieces together. Um, and it took me a long time, an embarrassingly long time, to realize that medical aid in dying, which is only available in 11 states, and FEN support services are completely parallel universe, different modality, different criteria, different everything. So as, as uh, our colleague said, why do we even need FEN? Because many people, even in California in a right to die state, don't uh, have the six month prognosis and the terminal diagnosis. And I'll just have to say California has the most applicants, and it's not just because we're a big state. I mean, I think that it's a value of a lot of Californians, and they don't, you know, they don't qualify for medical aid in dying, but they still want to be able to have, you know, self-deliver. Um, hello. Um, presumably, uh, after the exit, does the guide remove all the equipment and everything? Or no, it, it stays on? there. It no, stays but that's a really good question, because yeah. when I 
Uh, so six years ago when I uh, started, um, the guides did remove the equipment automatically. That was part of the protocol. And in fact, uh, when I was with Brian and Lowry, and they said, well, we're getting back on the plane to go home. We can't take this equipment. We're going to throw it in a dumpster. Do you want it? I was like, okay. So I now have the equipment. But that protocol has changed, and now, as Jenny will attest, the equipment is left in place. I mean, one of the things is it's against the law to mess with a death scene, and I'm not willing to take that on, you know. Um, so it's, it's been a movement within the organization, so we no longer, you know, remove the equipment. So, you know, there's a lot of things that you, can, you just have to be okay with. Um, I did have, like, one client who was very upset that, you know, the equipment was going to be left behind, and, you know, it took her almost three years to decide to exit because of this. And I just had to say, look, you know, your pain is finally going to outweigh your embarrassment about something that you're going to be dead anyway, and who cares, you know? Um, and her family knew what was happening. It wasn't like this was going to be a big surprise. Um, I mean, I was a lot more compassionate with her about that. <laughs> but it just, um, you know, at some point you just have to, like, let go. Well, and the other component is... Um so I have claustrophobia. I was like, no, I do not want to pull a hood over my head. But the, the hood is transparent, and there's somebody making eye contact, and it's always full, and it's like, not a problem. Yeah, I want to just say, like, we describe it as have, wearing, like, a plastic space helmet, you know? So it's, like, a, it's a pretty big bag, and there's a constant flow of nitrogen through the bag, and so it's never, like you know, those horror films or these torture scenes that you see where the bag is like stuck, like sucking on somebody's <laughs> face and you're like, I can't breathe. I mean, it's, it's not like that at all. When you um, breathe nitrogen, which is what we use, our air is 78% nitrogen. So when you're breathing our air, we're, right now we're breathing mostly nitrogen. And when you breathe nitrogen, and Jim and I both, you tried it, right? When we were at our training, we tried it out. And it feels like you're just breathing air. You don't feel any different. You get dizzy because you're not getting oxygen to your brain. And, um, and when that happens, you know, if we kept breathing for a while, we would pass out. Um, so. Uh, does the organization have any role for people that do qualify for MAID? Do volunteers, would a volunteer come out and help them if they were alone? No, that's a good question. So. Um, Yes, so the question was, do, does Final Exit Network have any support services with regard to medical aid and dying? So this is the one modality we support. We often uh, can work with our people who've called us and say, well, you know, you might well qualify for MAID. In fact, I had a client recently, and she was really pleased and grateful that she uh, did apply and exit using MAID, um, but other modalities like voluntarily stopping eating and drinking were asked, can, can the exit guide support that? No. Um, this is the one modality that we're trained in that we know works, and that's what we do. Um, could you say some more about the dementia part of the process since, since you, if the person has to be able to do it themselves, uh, and be of sound mind, how does that work if the person has dementia? That's a good question, and I'll tell a story that uh, my, my uh, pal Miriam tells. So she, uh, she was working with a, a fellow, and he had been approved, and she had the, exit, uh, the uh, education visit and was scheduling the second visit, because it's always two visits, one the education and then they call us back, call Jenny back and say, okay, now I'm really ready. So, but his family convinced him to postpone that second visit. There was a, I don't know, a grandchild coming or a wedding or I don't know what the family event was. And Miriam was like, this fellow is losing his cognitive ability. He better do this while he can. It's what we call the window of opportunity. And, but... They set a date, Miriam shows up, and the fellow had no idea who she was or why she was there. That's not, we can't move forward. But this particular story has an amazing coda because a couple weeks later, he says, well, where is she? Why didn't she come? 
get her here right now. Miriam lived close enough. She could drop everything, get in the car, go be with him. He knew exactly what was happening, was delighted to see her, and she was able to support the exit. But to your point, we have to do it while we can do it. Yeah, and I've had several clients who have dementia, but you know, it's like kind of on the early side, and they just kind of self-monitor, or they talk with, you know, their sons or daughters or whatever, and they're like, okay, can you let me know when you feel like I'm going over the edge? Because, you know, they really, and that's why we want to talk to the families, you know, like this is this person's value, and so really, you know, try to support them in this. And, you know, like we were saying before, Jim doesn't like the term, but I, you know, you have to leave some good days on the table. That's just, it's the trade-off, you know, it's either, and we never know when that last good day is going to be. I mean, nobody ever does. So if you really want control, you know, you just, you're going to have to take like a risk. Well, first of all, thank you for a great presentation. And my question is, um, at your last visit with somebody, can you talk a little bit about what the exit guide does? Um, we go in and we make sure that everything is secure. <laughs> the doors are all locked, the shades are all down, and... Um, we, uh, you know, we find out sometimes the person's not quite ready to go yet. Sometimes we talk a little bit. Um, I've been with people who wanted to do a little meditation together. Somebody, you know, wanted to read poetry. So we talk about that ahead of time. Like, what might you like, you know, when we show up? Some people are like, let's just do this. You know, like, they're just, like, so ready. And um, so if that happens, you know, we're like, okay, make sure you go to the bathroom, you know. And also, people do not lose their bowels during a process like this. It's not, like, dramatic or anything. But we do like people to, you know, void before the, the event, just in case. Um, and, you know, and then they just, like, we just start the whole process. I mean, I don't really want to, I don't know if we're allowed yeah. to go into all the details. But, I mean, we just, you know, there are very clear steps about, okay, you do this, you do this, you check this, you do this, you do pull this down, you take a breath, you, you know, exit, exhale. Um, there's a lot of step-by-step -step stuff that we do. And that's something that we've gone over during the education visit. We have the person write it down so that they know how to do it. And some people, um, people that have you know, memory issues. A lot of them like read it over so that they like every day so they just remember like what the steps are. But that's our role is to be there. You know, we don't help, but we can sure as hell, you know, we can educate them and be like, okay, we're tutoring you. Like, okay, do this now. Um, and there are a lot of those stories in the book. Like there's one, um, a single malt celebration of life and death. So somebody wanted a whiskey and can I have a whiskey? Be yeah, you can have a. So there's there's many of the stories are about how the the person's final final moments and their family unfolds. You know, I, I would like to say one thing about um, I one of the downsides that I feel like with final exit is for me, I don't want family members there. Um, I think witnessing someone die with a bag over their head is very very hard, and. I, that's not something that I want for a loved one to have to carry forward. Also, you know, the, thor the authorities do get involved. Like, somebody has to call 911, and, you know, they, the EMTs show up, then the police show up, then the coroner shows up. And a lot of times, like, the police have questions, and they will... It hasn't happened so much in California, but in other states I've heard you know, people talk about this where, you know, people are grieving, their loved one just died, and the police are grilling them, like, how did the person get a hold of this? How do they know how to do this? You know, and it's just like, oh my God, you just don't need that kind of worry. So I really, I personally um, do not want to have family members or friends there. It's not the same kind of thing, like medical aid in dying is more like, you know, putting an animal down where they peacefully just kind of slide out. It's a very different thing to watch someone die with a bag over their head. So, um, that, I think to me, that's kind of a downside. Yeah, you have much more experience than I do, but I was with several people, and as a friend, not as a family member, and they went smoothly and with a smile on their face, and I, there was no investigation, so I was not 
Well, there was a potential investigation. What happened to the cat? <laughs> <laughs> well, I have not seen people going with a smile on their face. Uh, I mean, like maybe they start out that way, but it's like that was, hasn't been my experience. Right. So. Well, let's take so a couple as, more questions. Yeah, as always, this conversation can go on for a long time. I ha we have time for one more question, and this person is getting one. <laughs> I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about, uh, you mentioned that you, the person has to submit medical records. I mean, do they get them from the doctor or does the doctor send them directly to final exit? And who looks at them when they get to final exit? And what criteria are used to say, well, yeah, this person qualifies or not? That's a good question, Diane. Um, so the medical records have to substantiate what's in the personal statement. So it doesn't, ha it can be a, a recent physical, whatever captures the current situation because, um, and the coordinator, I mean, I barely look at the medical records because I don't know how to read them. I'm the paper pusher. I send them to the medical review committee and they go through and they know what they're looking for and they make a determination. And as I say, sometimes they ask for additional medical records and we've had people who the medical records are not uh, sufficient and many, many people have given up on Western medicine or Western medicine has given up on, on their mysterious malady. So it's not, it's not slam dunk by any means. It's a process and that's why as a coordinator I talk to people again and again and again and they I say put those details in your in your personal statement. I've gotten uh, letters that are a paragraph or two. I've got one that was 16 pages. Hopefully, they fall in between that. But it's the the powerful personal statement, the medical records that document it. Then there's the interview, which goes through even more invasive questioning about the physical capabilities, about the physical space, about pets, about all kinds of things. So I think Final Exit Network has a really tight process and protocol to protect the volunteers and to protect potential clients. Um, and you can also, like most of the time, you can download these records yourself, right, from you know your online medical portal. So you don't even have to call your doctor. And you know, I wouldn't like talk to them and say, "Hey, I'm applying for final exit," and they ask me for this. You know, just um, you know, you just ask for your medical records. And sometimes I've just seen even just like one letter, you know, saying, "Oh, this person has been diagnosed with dementia," you know, from like the doctor, and that's kind of it's sufficient. It, yeah, yeah, I mean, I don't know all the time, but it has been like that. Right, and and Jenny raises a good point. We often. Uh, counsel people not to ask their physicians directly for the medical records because then that could, uh, they may do, well, what do you need them for? And may feel compelled to do what's called mandatory reporting uh, and then put them on suicide watch or welfare check and subvert the process. And I've had personal experience where a woman had been accepted, her physician called me, how did he get my phone number? And she was no longer a, a client. So we recommend calling the office manager requesting the medical records. Everyone has the legal right to their medical records. So they don't need to know what's going on. I'm changing my insurance policy, whatever FIB um, makes sense, but uh, we have that right. Does that answer your question, Diane? So um, we're over time, as we often are, but I just wanted to read one very short um, expression of gratitude by, um, uh, by Anonymous. It's called Blessed by the Universe, and this is the last piece in the book. Dear Coordinator, I wanted to write my thanks to you before time runs out. You've smoothed, smoothed the way for me greatly, and my guide is following suit. I feel very blessed by the universe. Something I want to capture and share with you and Fan is the great sense of peace I feel now that I'm closing whole areas of what has been a fulfilling life. 
It feels right to be closing out belongings and past accomplishments, to linger over pictures before I discard them, and to be able to take time while I'm still well enough to rest in my gratitude for everyone and everything. Under ordinary circumstances, I think one would be too ill or stressed to have this luxury of time for reflection and appreciation. I'm so glad I started the process back in the fall as my tumor is relentless in its progression and I emphasize how important starting is. Once begun, you and the organization have made it all move forward so smoothly. I thank you deeply for your commitment, kindness, and caring and I wish you a long and happy life. So if you, if you haven't already done so, we have celebrity booksellers back there. F. Alan Sawyer and J. John Priola will take your $10 bills. And um, we have business cards, right? With, so if you and want, we have business if you cards. Want to know who to call or look at the yeah, website. Yeah, if you know somebody wanna... who wants counseling, have them contact the organization. And thank you to the library for making this happen. And thank you to you. Thank you, Jim and Jenny, for being so supportive. And thank you all for being here. I know you all are here for a reason. And I applaud your courage just for coming to this event. And keep an eye out. We will do more death cafes and more death, dying, and grieving. Thank you.